dozens, millions of other Christians that this particular text is a controversial one. And I am um, trying to be sympathetic to that as much as possible. And, and so I understand that there are differences represented in this room. And I know that this passage typically, historically, over the many centuries uh, that theologians have fought and, and, and debated over it, that people generally take uh, one of three ways uh, of approaching it. Either they read the passage and it's so offensive to them that they uh, decide to ignore it, or they read the passage and they can't believe what it says, so they take time and energy and effort to redefine what it says, or there are those who just accept it as it is, truth, and uh, not try to necessarily understand it to its fullest, but accept it as it is. It is truth. I'm in that third category. I'm a biblicist, so I'm not going to ignore the passage. And if you're new here this morning, here's what we do at the Cross Church. We take books of the Bible, and we literally go verse by verse all the way through them, studying them. And so when we get to some of these tricky passages, we don't abandon it and jump to something else that's easier to, to teach. We tackle it. We, we take it head on. And we dive deep into it to try to understand it. And that's what we're doing in this particular passage. But I do understand that over the many, many years of Christendom that this has been a challenging passage. And so some of you may not agree with the perspective that I'm going to put on it this morning. And that's why I am dedicating as much of the time that I can. I went, I went to over this morning in the first service and my prayers, like God help me not to go over again on the, the second service here, but there's a lot to say, and I want to squeeze as much as I can to, into the amount of time that I have to, to squeeze it in, because I think it's important that you understand that what Romans 9 says is not an island to itself, that the, the entirety of Scripture complements what we're reading here, that, that these are not some radical ideas about God that don't sit well with the rest of Scripture. What I would like for you to see is that what Paul says about God in these verses aligns perfectly with what we see elsewhere in the Bible. And so I'm going to make that case here today. And, and also you'll figure out as we go through Romans that what we are seeing in Romans 9 is going to look radically different than what we will see in Romans 10. I cannot think of two chapters in the Bible that are so different from each other. They're like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. All of what you learn in Romans 9 seems to be totally flipped upside down in Romans chapter number 10. In fact, I could, I could probably define Romans 9 in two words, and I could define Romans 10 in two words. I could define Romans 9 this way. God's sovereign election. I know that's three, so we'll just say God's election. But I wanted to throw that sovereign in him. God's election. God's election. That, that's all of Romans 9. Now you get to Romans 10, and I could define it with two words as well, man's faith. In Romans 9, you see God's sovereign election, and in Romans 10, you see man's responsibility by faith. And on the surface, those may seem like opposing truths. They may seem like contradictions to each other in regards to our salvation. And that therein is where the problem lies, where so many in Christianity has fought with each other over what appears to be those two opposing truths. I do not personally see them as opposing truths. I do not see them as contradictions with each other. Charles Spurgeon was once asked if he could reconcile God's sovereignty and man's responsibility in salvation. He very quickly responded to that question by saying, no, there's no reason to. I never reconcile friends. And the point that he's making is, in Scripture, God's sovereignty and election and man's exercise of free will and responsibility to choose, to repent, to f and place an individual's faith in God are not opposing truths. That both are clearly presented, and we'll see it all throughout Romans 9 and 10, that they are not enemies to each other, that they complement each other. Now, granted, 
Almost none of us, and I would maybe even dare say none of us, can fully understand it. And Paul doesn't even attempt to try to explain it. He just simply presents it as facts. Here are the facts. Accept it as it is. And we'll see that time and time again throughout the scriptures. And so here's my goal this morning. I want to help you understand that God has made a promise with himself in eternity to save certain individuals, and he intends to keep his promise that he made to those individuals. Let me say that again, because that, that's ultimately the goal that I want to take this, and I, and I want to use scripture to prove that point. God has made a promise with himself in eternity to save certain individuals, and he intends to keep his promise to those individuals. And I was very precise on the words that I chose there. I want to take you on a journey through Scripture. So here's what I want you to do. I'm going to have to fly through it. Now, this is a study this morning. I'm not going to be yelling at you and, you know, you can put the Kleenexes away. I don't know if they'll be tears. Grab a pen instead, a pen and paper. This is a Bible study this morning. So uh, you need a pen and a paper because I'm going to treat you the way Paul treated the Bereans. When he went to preach to the Bereans, he presented, he unloaded on them a ton of information that was all new to them. And they went home, they took the passages of Scripture that he preached, and they studied the Scriptures, and they researched the Scriptures to verify whether the things Paul said was true or not. I think that's going to be the case here. There's not enough time to really unpack all of the passages that we're going to look at, so I want you to pin them down. And I want you to go home as students yourself, look those passages up, study them in their context, and see what you come to. Don't just take my word for it. Study the Bible yourself. I'm going to present the facts of 20 plus years of research on, on my behalf, and I want to just pass it along to you, and you go home and you research yourself and see for yourself that it is, I believe, in Scripture. I also think I could say this. I could agree with the Apostle Paul as far as um, what my goal and mission this morning is when he said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse number 4, Knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. That's another way of wording my goal this morning. That you, the beloved brethren, would know and understand your election by God. And when the Bible uses the word election, it means what it sounds like it means. Often in the New Testament, God uses the word elect or election, and they mean what you think it means. Just as every four years we elect a president uh, or we elect officials every two years to Congress and so forth, or we elect uh, governors and mayors and so forth, you cast a vote, you choose, uh, you make an individual choice. When God uses that word, it means the same thing. That we are the elect of God and that God has chosen us. God has elected us to be his children. And I want you to see from scripture this morning an understanding of that. Now here's what you need to come to terms with. When you read Romans 9 and Romans 10, once again you are getting two different perspectives of your salvation. In Romans 9, you are getting a perspective of your salvation from God's view, from God's perspective. It is a vertical perspective. What salvation looks like from a vertical perspective, from a heavenly perspective. When you read Romans chapter number 10, you're going to get a horizontal perspective, a man's perspective of what salvation looks like. And that's why the two look and feel very, very different from one another. Now, ultimately, what I hope that you'll conclude is what Jonah concluded. If you remember in the Old Testament, Jonah was a prophet, and God sent Jonah to the Ninevites, which he didn't want to go, and you remember the story of the the well and, and so forth. Eventually, he ends up in Nineveh. He preaches to them. They repent, and they turn to God. Blows his mind. He can't believe that these pagan, evil, wicked people would turn to God. He couldn't understand it. And the conclusion of the book of Jonah is Jonah chapter 2, verse number 9. This is what Jonah said. Salvation is of the Lord. That was his conclusion. 
It wasn't my preaching, Jonah said. It wasn't because these people were worthy of this message. It wasn't because they were willing to the entire nation to repent and turn to God. It is obvious that something supernatural has happened, that salvation has come to these people, and it must have only been by the grace of God. So therefore, salvation is of the Lord. Paul put it this way. After many years of ministry and traveling around, he said to those living in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse, 15, or 15 and verse number 10, he says, By the grace of God, I am what I am. What Paul had concluded in his life was this. I am only saved and I am only serving the one and only true God because of his grace. I cannot conclude it to being for any other reason. And I hope that you and I this morning can come to that same conclusion, that I am what I am only because of the grace of God. It is only because of the mercy that he has showed me and that salvation is all of the Lord. Now I want to dive into Romans 9 this morning, but I'm not going to dive very deep. We're going to do a basic overview of these verses, and I'm going to come back to it next time I'm with you. And so let's look at Romans 9. At the end of verse number 4, Paul makes this statement here. He's talking about this list of privileges of the nation of Israel. And one of those, he says, at the end of verse number four, he says, and the promises. And I talked a little bit about that last week. There are plenty of promises, many, many promises that God has given to the nation of Israel. But the, the premier promise that God has given to the nation of Israel is salvation and redemption and the promise of the Messiah to come and the promise of a national salvation. And so there is this promise of redemption and salvation given to the people of Israel. However, Paul comes along and he preaches what would appear to be a new gospel. It's not a new gospel, but it's a new covenant. And the covenantal uh, con uh, that the covenant that God has made has now been changed because the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, has now been fulfilled in the person of Christ and it is no longer necessary. There is now the new covenant in the blood of Christ where he was the righteousness and the sacrifice and so he fulfilled all of the Mosaic covenant. And they're confused by this, this new Messiah that is coming along because he now offers salvation, which he always has, they didn't believe it before, but he now offers salvation to all the ends of the earth. And Paul has already said in Romans chapter number 4 that it doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or a Gentile or Greek or barbarian, male or female, that we are all one in Christ. And for his Jewish audience, they're scratching their heads thinking, no, 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 wait a minute. We're the chosen people of God. We have promises that are coming to us. God, you can't, you can't say that, Paul, because God made the promises that are exclusive to us alone. And so Paul has to answer that question. And he does that beginning in verse number six, where Paul says this, but it is not that the word of God has taken no effect. Now, another way of wording that would be that it's not that the word of God has failed. The Greek word there, taken no effect, in the Greek it's one word, and it is just simply the word fallen. So you could word it this way. It's not that God's word has fallen failed. It's not that God's word has fallen short. It's not that God has been unable to keep his promises. That's their argument. They're looking at Paul thinking, if what you're saying is true, then God failed to keep his promises to us. Then God lied to us. Ultimately, if what you're saying about Jesus is true, then God's a liar and he hasn't kept his promise to us. And so Paul enters into an argument with them of unpacking through the Old Testament how God is keeping his promise to them and that the salvation of the Gentile nations is not an abandonment of God's promises to the nation of Israel and also that how God works with the Israelites is exactly the same way he acts with the Gentiles as well, that salvation is of the Lord, whether you are a Jew or a Gentile like. In fact, by the way, I keep referring back to Jonah because the book of Jonah is a good case study of how God saves. And if you remember, the Ninevites were not Jews. And in that case, it was repentance and faith that brought about their salvation. And it was the preaching of the message of Jonah that brought about salvation. And nothing has ever changed from that day to this day. God is the one who ultimately saves and it is his gospel message that he uses to bring that about. 
But Paul, like I said, I don't want to spend too much time in the text here this morning because i got a lot of ground to cover. And so let's begin, once again, verse number 6. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect or, or that it has failed, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. What he means is, not everyone born of the heritage or bloodline of Abraham, not everyone born Jewish is actually an Israelite. He says in verse number 7, nor are they all children because they are of the seed of Abraham. Just because they can trace their lineage to Abraham, they, that does not necessarily mean that they are Israelites. What makes them an Israelite? And the answer is found in verse number, beginning in verse number 7, where he gives two examples. He says, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham, but in Isaac your seed shall be called, that is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as children. Now, he quotes at the end of verse number 7 from Genesis 21, verse number 12. And then he quotes from Genesis 18 and verse number 10 at the conclusion of verse number 9. Notice what it says. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. Now, once again, I'm going to dive in deeper into that next time. But the main argument that he makes with, with this analogy of, um, of Isaac is this. That God promises his salvation. Uh, that God's promise of salvation is not according to heritage. It's not according to bloodline, which is what the Jewish people assumed. That if I were born a Jew, then I am automatically saved. That I'm automatically redeemed. And he is making this argument that Abraham had two sons. He actually had more than that. But in this case, we're talking about the two sons. One was older than the other. Ishmael was older than Isaac, but it was God who chose Isaac. Now, many would read that and go, well, that's on a national level, and, and so you can't really use that as an argument for an individual case. And so Paul gives another example, and this second example is of Jacob. In verse number 10, he says, and not only this, but when Rebekah also conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand. Not of works, but of him who calls. It was, said to the, it was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. That's a quote from Genesis 25, 23. Verse 13, and as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And that's a quote from Malachi chapter 1 and verse number 2. And the point that Paul is making in this second example is that God's promise of salvation is not according to good deeds. Or you could take it a step further, that God's promise of salvation is not according to anything related to us. It is outside of us. I mean, the argument that he makes in verse number 11 is, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election stands. It had nothing to do with the children. Whatever it was that they became or did, whatever it was that their life unfolded as, that had nothing to do with their good works or their evil works. It had nothing to do with whether they were in the right home or not. It had nothing to do with that. It had everything to do with the purpose of God, the election of God in the process. And so in the case of the example of Isaac, God's promise of salvation is not according to heritage. In the case of Jacob's example here, God's promise of salvation is not according to good works. Ultimately, the conclusion is, is that our salvation is of God, both of Israel and of us as individuals, which Paul is going to make that argument as we continue to go through the text here. And the key verse is verse number 18. If you would look at that, at the end of verse number 8, he says this. I said 18, but verse number 8. At the end of verse number 8, he says this, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. The children of the promise are counted as the seed. The seed being the children of God. Now what is the point that he's making? They are the children of God not because they're born Jewish. They are the children of God not because they've done good deeds in their life. 
They are the children of God because God had promised to them that they would be the children of God. And this not only applies to the Jewish people, but the Gentiles as well. He'll make that argument as he goes later on into the, the chapter here. But the children of the promise. So here's the point. God has promised to certain individuals throughout the spectrum of history that they will be his children. And those that he has made that promise to who will be his children, those are the ones who will become his children. You say, I don't believe you. Well, that's why I need to take an entire sermon to go through the scriptures to unpack the reality that this is not an island to itself, that elsewhere in the New Testament and the Old Testament we see this. So let's begin here. Uh, Titus chapter number one, if you would turn there. And from this point on, I'm going to move as fast as I can because I have a lot of ground to cover. And so just write down these passages. I'm going to read them, make a couple of comments about them, and I'm going to move on here. Titus chapter 1, verse number 1 says this, Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before time began. So before time ever began, God made a promise of salvation and redemption to individuals in the world and that we know that if we have repented and put our faith in Jesus Christ and we are following him as disciples, we are following him as our Lord and Savior, that we have the hope, we have the security that we are his because he has fulfilled that promise in us. 2 Timothy chapter number 2 verse number 13 says this, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. In other words, if I feel like I can't have enough faith to be the child of God, it doesn't really matter because my faithlessness is irrelevant in the eyes of God because he will be faithful in spite of me. He cannot deny himself. He has made a vow to himself. He has made a covenant to himself. He has made a promise to himself that he will choose you. He will save you. He will elect you. And if he has made that promise to himself, he will keep that. He cannot deny what he has promised himself. So it really doesn't matter if you think you have enough faith or not. God will make sure that the work that he begins in you, he will complete to the end. In Hebrews chapter number 6 and verse number 12, Hebrews has a lot to say about this particular subject. Now, I would love to spend more time in the book of Hebrews, but for time's sake, I'm only going to look at a couple of passages. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13 says this, For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no, greater, uh, no one greater, he swore by himself. I love that statement. It's, it's humorous to me. It's, God comes to Abraham and says, I'm going to make a promise to you and to your descendants. And I swear by the name of uh, myself, because nobody bigger than me. <laughs> there's, there's only only I, can, I can swear by my own name because there I know it will be secure. I know it will stand. And so he swore by himself, saying, verse 14, Surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise, for men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, that's you and I, we are the heirs of promise. God made the promise to Abraham, and we are the benefactors many centuries later. We are the heirs of that promise. The immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, in other words, two things that cannot change, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul. I have an anchor in my soul knowing that my salvation is, is secure and that it is eternal because God has made a vow, a promise to himself. He, he sealed that oath in his own name. 
And he will keep that promise to the heirs of that promise, which are us today and those who will come after us. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 15 says this, And for this reason he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. So when I said earlier in, Roman, in Hebrews chapter number 6, when he talks about the heirs of the promise, we're not talking about Jewish people. What we are talking about is those whom he has called, those who in eternity past he set aside for himself, he chose for himself. Here in Hebrews 9 it very clearly says, those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. So he has set aside and called individuals into this eternal, this eternal inheritance. If you're able, go to Acts chapter number 2. I want you to see this passage. Acts 2, verse number 32. This is, of course, the scene where Paul is on the day of Pentecost. He is standing and he is preaching to a vast number of people. We don't know exactly how many are there, but it's a, it's a sea of people. And at the conclusion of his sermon, 3,000 of them become believers and followers of Jesus Christ. And in Acts chapter 2, verse number 32, this is the day of Pentecost, by the way, Peter is coming to a conclusion of his sermon, and he says in verse number 32, This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. That was given in the Old Testament. I could take you to multiple passages where the Holy Spirit was promised, not just to the nation of Israel, but to all of the world those that are his, he poured out this which you now see and hear. Verse 38, then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is to you. Now he's speaking predominantly to a Jewish audience. A lot of Jewish people have traveled into Jerusalem for the Passover season, and, and they're there for that reason. But there are a lot of other individuals from other nations that are there as well. And so he says, this promise is to you and to your children, to the Jewish children who will be born, and to all who are far off. Now that's terminology predominantly only used by Jewish people. They referred to Gentiles as those who were afar off, those who were not near to God. Uh, they were outside of God's redemption. And so Peter says the promise of this salvation, the promise of this Holy Spirit is to those of you who are here today, and it is to your children who will be born tomorrow, and it is to all of the Gentiles who are afar off. And the conclusion and as many as the Lord our God will call. 